Welcome everyone to History of Christian Theology Part 5. This is David the Real Medvites and tonight we're going to be talking about the Nestorian Christ and the Council of Chalcedon. And before I start, I want to say two things. I want to start by saying um, some might have noticed, I didn't really get any complaints, but I some might have noticed that I don't really talk much about ecumenical councils in this video. It's because this is about, this is not about history. It's about the history of theology, but not about the history and what happened in the councils, so on and so forth. For that, there are many other people that deal with that issue. Uh, from the start, this has always been about the theology, not merely the history of who did what. Secondly, I want to say, if you're scared of this being part five, if you're only interested in this, but you haven't seen the previous parts, you can still nevertheless watch this, right? You can literally watch any part that interests you without having to watch the previous parts. I might be referencing some things that I said previously. Uh, nevertheless, they're not too big of a deal. Just saying out there. So let's begin with our presentation today. And we're going to be looking at whether the Christologies of Nestorius, Severus, and orthodoxy are all the same right this is going to be about modern day ecumenism and what's going on then we will be looking at the polynarianism nestorianism saint Kirill's response to nestorianism and then uh, what happened at the council of chalcedon so i want to start this with a forward we are seeing this general narrative going around that uh, us nestorians and monophysites we all have actually the same christology and we have this language barrier that prevents us from being in unity and that created historical precedents. But we just somehow found out just now that we have the same Christology. And this line of argumentation has been used by very popular figureheads that we see in the modern age. One of them is by Marmilis Zaya, who is the Metropolitan of Australia. He's from the Church of the East. This is the church that considers Nestorius Theodore of Tarsus, Theodore of Mopsus, all of these Nestorian characters as saints. And on the other side, we have Peter Farrington, who's a priest. Uh, he also believes that we have the same Christology. Right? That's the church that believes Severus of Antioch is a saint. And I think it's really interesting, it's important to note that both of these extremes, right? They, they're supposedly opposite with one another, but... They, they, have this, they have the same rhetoric. They have the same style of argumentation. Don't debate Christology. We already believe in the same thing. We don't need to do the debate. We just need to do the debate on church history. That's what we need to do. And that's what the debate is. That's how they attempt to shift the debate to. But of course, that is unacceptable. That's not what should be the case. And so in this video... We will present a view where the Christologies really are distinct. And neither do we have the same Christology as Severus, nor do we have the same Christology as Nestorius. Neither. Right? We don't we don't take either position. Both of them are wrong. So they are both diametrically opposed heresies, just like modalism and Arianism. And this excuse of language barrier is anti-scripture. It goes against scripture because in, in the book of Acts. What we see, we see, we see apostles speaking in tongues. We see them speaking in multiple different languages. If if the if that can happen, then how can you even claim that there has been a massive language barrier that prevents the churches from being back in unity? You might say that it might have begotten misunderstanding. That's not what I'm talking against, right? So there there might generally be linguistic misunderstandings. I think that is the case in some parts of history but to attribute schisms to language barriers to language mistakes this is what all ecumenists do and i think this is what all people who don't trust in their own christology do so roman a lot i'm not gonna say all but a lot of the roman catholics do this too in regards to the filioque where they will say oh uh really it's just a language barrier we apparently we believe in the same thing no i think i think this line of thinking is really just them admitting oh we don't really we them admitting that they're wrong so they're trying to co-op their position to be like ours but that is simply anti-scriptural schisms happen because of legitimate 
theological differences, and this is what this video is going to be defending. This is what I always defend. This is what I always believe. So let's start with this video on Apollinarianism. And who is Apollinus of Laodicea? He was born in Latakia. He died in 382. Uh, he was the bishop of Laodicea. So Latakia, I'll call it Latakia. Latakia is uh, an area in Syria, right? So this is, this is a city in Syria. He was a bishop of that area. He was a highly respected bishop and be because he was anti-Aryan, right? During his time, Arianism was the big deal. So he was very vividly anti-Aryan. And due to that, he was very respected. He was friends with Saints Athanasius and Vasil. But here is the problem with Apollinarius is that he denied that Christ had a human soul. This is his first, uh, first view. And he fixed his position to state that Christ did not have a human mind. Uh, and he, he didn't even equal, he rather considered that the mind was equal to hypostasis. Some people believe that we're going to be getting to that in the next slide. But so he basically denied that Christ had a human mind. That's what his denial was. And so his teachings were condemned in the first council of Constantinople. So this is the second ecumenical council. His teachings were condemned. And let's look at his presuppositions. So some of the presuppositions are correct. Some of them are not. So for example, his stress was that there was a single incarnate divine person. And he, he, he believed that Christ had to be a single incarnate divine person for Christianity to make any sense. Right. So a lot of his Aaron apologetics uh, depend on that. But his other presupposition is that personhood will, was reducible to a certain category. In the case of Apollonius, it was first the soul, then that, that changed, and now it became the mind, right? So now the mind uh, is that. And Socrates, in Ecclesiastical History, he says that first they will say a soul, he's talking about Apollinarians, was not assumed by the word of God in the economy of his becoming man. Then, revising their position as if out of repentance, they asserted that he assumed a soul for himself, but had no mind. And that instead of a mind, God the word took its place for the man who was assumed. And Demetrius Patrelos also says, Stylianus Papadopoulos is right in arguing that for Apollinarius, human hypostasis resides in the mind, right? So he didn't equate it with the mind, but rather the hypostasis resided in the human mind, right? So it, personhood was a faculty of mind, you could say in some, some sense. And this is an error of Apollinaris, but this is a presupposition of his. All actions that Christ does, whether they are divine acts or human acts, are ultimately attributed to the person of Christ, right? And we don't really disagree with that. And the fullness of a nature includes its hypostasis to complete, right? So you cannot say something is fully human without also saying there needs to be a human hypostasis. And this is going to be very crucial because this is the same exact presupposition for both for Nestorians and for Monophysites. This is not the presupposition that actually, we don't share this presupposition as Orthodox. We actually deny this presupposition. Now, let's look at this Christology as a result of these uh, presuppositions of Apollinaries. The enfleshed Logos is one nature, one hypostasis, one energy, one person, the same fully God and fully man, right? So he coins the term one incarnate nature of God the Word. We're going to be getting to this term. This is a very famous a uh, controversial term, but it's coined by him. Some people, Leon of Jerusalem uh, claims that it was even coined by Arians themselves. Um, whether that makes sense, uh, I don't think, maybe it does, but I don't think it's wool because Apollinarius himself argued, argued against Arians, so I don't really see how that's possible. <clears throat> but we know that it, Apollinarius came, uh, used that term, right? For Apollinarius, the mutability of the human mind, right? The human mind by design is mutable. And for him, morality is just a dialectically choice between good and evil, right? So if the human mind is mutable, then it fluctuates. If it fluctuates, then it's going to be choosing between the two options inevitably. If the human mind only chooses the good, then for Apollinaris, it's impossible for the human mind for us to say that it's mutable, right? Because it's only choosing the good. There's the same exact objection from the monotolites. And to give a preview of what we're going to be talking about, about the monotolites crisis, uh, we will say that good and evil is not a dialectical uh, morality, right? 
is not a it's not something that's dialectical it's not something between good and evil so for example in heaven and as a matter of fact this presupposition this this understanding will lead to uh, origins eternal fall or it will lead to human beings being immutable and it seems like that's what Apollinarius will think. He will take the second option rather than Origen's eternal fall option. But as we talked about this in part one, I believe, uh, free will is not something defined by good, uh, good evil. In, the, in heaven, for example, there's going to be multiple goods that we can choose from, right? So there, there's going to be distinct goods. They're all goods, but we still have free will to choose which one. It's not something, oh, it's... You either choose what's evil or you either choose what's good. That's not our understanding of good and evil. But for Apollinarius, it seems like this has infected his Christology. And Dimitrios Batrelos in page 13 of Byzantine Christ says that Apollinarius' suggestion is that for a mutable rational creature, sin is in fact not avoidable. Right. So we, pretty much what I just said. Christ then has only one will and that's a divine will. Why? Because if it was a human will, then it will be, well, the human will is mutable. So Christ cannot be said to have a divine will, a uh, human will, sorry. So he only has one will. So for Apollinaris, uh, Christ has one, one will. He's a monotolite and he's a monoenergist because Christ only has one nature. Now, let's look at the problems in Apollinarianism. St. Gregory the Theologian, Epistle 101, says that for that which he has not assumed, he has not healed. Right? And but says such a, a one, the Godhead took the place of the human intellect. How does this touch me? For Godhead joined to flesh alone is not man, nor to soul alone, nor to both apart from intellect, which is the most essential part of man. Right? So for St. Gregory Theologian, the intellect is the most essential part of man. And keep then the whole man and mingle Godhead, Godhead their wit, that you may benefit me in my completeness. But he asserts, he could not contain two perfect natures. Very, it's going to be very crucial in next part because here we see St. Gregory the Theologian talking about two natures in Christ. So there is a debate already in the 4th century whether Christ has one nature or two natures. So this is kind of like a preview of the crisis that we're going to be seeing in the next part where the whole debate is going to be on whether Christ has one nature or two nature and what does nature even mean in that context. Right? All of that is going to be seen. Uh, Jorgos Fl Florowski says that by condemning the Apollinarian heresy with its pessimistic view of the human mind, the church ratified the possibility and even the obligation of studying theology. So Florowski, Father Florowski says that at that point, the church realized that we can't just not study theology. We can't just be silent. We can't just be passive about theology. We have to be active and we have to actually take on studying theology. I wish some of our hierarchs today will express that opinion. Uh, because I definitely 100% agree with this statement. But nevertheless, that's the point of this video series, is to study theology. Helps people study theology. Another problem is that he denies human faculties in Christ, such as will and energy. Right? So, Christ cannot even be said to be fully human, not only because he's not a human person, but because he lacks these faculties that make him a human person. And we also need to remind ourselves... The restoration of all nature will unite man with God. So the restoration, apocalyptic is going to mirror the incarnation, right? The hypostatic union, the unity of Christ's human nature with divine nature. It's going to be very crucial because whatever doct whatever understanding of the union that Christ's humanity and divinity has, that is going to apply to the apocalyptic because. There's not going to be a hypostatic union in the apocalyptic but there's going to be restoration and the unity of all natures to God, right? All nature is going to be restored and recapitulated in Christ. So if Christ's humanity does not have a human will, then how could someone that denies the, denies universalism say, well, uh, not everyone is saved. Well, how can how is that possible? Because in the case of Christ, his humanity did not have a human will. And in the Apocatistasis, in the, in, the, in the eschaton, neither will our human will be then. Because it's not assumed, it's not healed. And 
this is something that we will get back on, but this is going to be a very crucial thing for us to understand. And this implies originist apocatastasis because the divine will overpowers the human will or the human will straight up it does not exist and is not healed. Let's get to the star of this show, baby. It's Nestorius. We are going to be talking about Nestorianism and his theology, but let's talk about who he is in the first place. Nestorius was born in modern-day Karaman Marash in 386. He died in 451. I believe 452, 451, 452, somewhere along those lines. He became a bishop of Constantinople in 428. And he was he was a conservative bishop. He wasn't a liberal. He was a conservative bishop. And he was also very amateurish, very undiplomatic. He didn't know when to shut up. He didn't know when to speak. And he had a lot of these strange outbursts at random times which was very undiplomatic he numerous times insulted uh royalty and this caused many problems with him for him later down the road when when uh, he tried to diplomacy his way out of the first council of ephesus he couldn't do that because of the way he acted so he didn't really have a good character his style of argumentation was what I will describe as autistic, but some other people will describe it as highly scholastic, highly technical, highly, um, you know, detailed, let's say. And he got condemned in Ephesus 431 in the Third Ecumenical Council. He was sent to Upper Egypt until his death. He was exiled there at, I believe, 435. And he is considered as a saint, not only for the Church of the East, but also the Eastern Catholic Churches namely the Surah Malabar and Chaldean Catholic churches. He is considered as a saint for those churches as well today. What Now, let's talk about, before I even talk about what Nestorius' Christology is, let's talk about what he wanted, because I think that's also very important. And if I don't talk about that, I think it kind of invites a possible problem where people might say, oh, but Nestorius, all he really wanted is what we wanted. And he really seems to be saying the same things that we say. This is kind of like the line of various quote-unquote scholars today. But many of those supposed scholars, they haven't really checked up on how the church reacted in the Fifth Ecumenical Council. So Nestorius wanted a single subject Christology. So he's very well known. His, his doctrine is very well known for being the two-son Christology. But that's not because he wanted it to be a Tucson Christology. Rather, the logical conclusion led to a Tucson Christology is what's the case. So in the Bazaar of Heraclides, he explicitly denies the doctrine of two sons. Right? He distinguishes the natures to protect double consubstantiality. For, so for Christ to be both God and man, for him, is very important. And he tries to distinguish the natures as to avoid heresies, especially those of Apollinarius, which for many Syrians was probably a lesson for them to learn. The glory of the divine nature being maintained even after in the consciousness of for Nestorius, right? He just went, the church just went through Arianism and it's still going through Arianism, right? There's still Arian apologists that's going around. And so he's, he's very sensitive, we could say, he's very sensitive uh, to protect the divinity, right? Because a lot of the Arian apologetics is how can Christ be... The, it's basically the same Muslim apologetics. And so for Nestorius, he was very sensitive on how to respond to that. And to this, this, motiva this motivates the scriptural consistency in regards to the person of Christ. So for example, Mark 13, 32. How can Christ be God yet not know the art? Right? This is one of the perennial questions for Nestorius that really... Um, let's say, motivated him to take the approach that he took, right? So this is what he wanted. But let us not forget what we want. Many times in our, in our theology, what we want can be different from what we actually get. And this is the, same, this is the case for Nestorius. So for Nestorius, let's look at his presupposition. Distinction equals division. This is very key in Nestorius. Uh, Saint Kirill, in his second letter to Nestorius, he, sends, he gives him a second letter. Nestorius replies to it. And Nestorius says, I, I congratulate you for dividing the natures. But if you read the second letter, uh, St. Kirill does not divide the natures. right? But Nestorius reads him as if he divides the natures. Why? Because St. Kirill in the second letter distinguishes the natures. And Nestorius looks at that and says, oh, so you're, dis 
you're also dividing the natures. So for him, very key presupposition that we see in the Hellenics distinction is division. The fullness of a nature includes a hypostasis. We see this in Apollinarius. There is no nature without a hypostasis. And there's a, there's a confusion of nature and person. He does not distinguish nature and person properly. There's a confusion there. For him, unity and multiplicity cannot remain without a loss of identity of one of them. So, so here's an example of it. St. Kiel says that Christ is one out of two realities, right? Divinity and humanity. He is one. So this is a typical line that St. Kiel uses. And Nestorius says, if Christ becomes one out of two, well, if he's not, if he's not two and he is one, then how is, it, how is that not a mixture? And if you notice, this is actually an argument that I use. And so some, some Orientals might say, aha, you just admitted that you're Nestorian. Uh, no, because St. Kirill says that the, that the two holes become one, but the two natures, the two substances become one person. He's not saying that, that that person is the end product of the union of those two natures, but rather the two realities uh, form a, a separate reality, you can say, right? Whereas Nestorius could not really fathom that because he, couldn't, because he confused nature and person. He considered them the same thing. And so two out of one was impossible without a mixture. So this is a difference between me and Nestorius is that he does not distinguish nature and person. But I do. So St. Kirill believes in it and St. Kirill does as well. So St. Saint, Saint Kirill believes in a real synthesis. A synthesis of the two natures where they retain their identity in the person of Christ. We'll get to this later on in his response to Nestorius. For Nestorius, the name signify natures. What does this mean? Well, the name Jesus signifies the human nature. And the name God or the word signifies the divine nature. This is very crucial because this is a very exegetical basis. There's a huge exegetical basis of Nestorius' Christology. And for him, the name Christ signifies both of the natures, like Christ, Son, Lord. They signify both natures. So, for example, this is why when you say to Nestorius, the Virgin Mary is the Theotokos, Nestorius says that's impossible because Theo, God, that signifies the divine nature. Do you, are you saying that the Virgin Mary gave birth to the divine nature? So this is the basis of his objection. So I'm not saying that, oh, he has a point. This is a wrong presupposition. But you see the logic. You see, you see where he comes up with this logic, right? You see where he comes from. So the story in Christology is this, that there is a union of the two natures, but this is, not, this is not an essential union, but it's by conjunction. So the two natures work in conjunction with one another. So it's akin to two partners working together, and thus it is a prosopic union. The union is by will. And so if there's a unity of will, then there's, there is one will. So Christ has one will. Notice a pattern here. Apollinarius says Christ has one will. Nestorius says Christ has one will. There's an there's a important pattern here. And when offsides, we will check them later on, also believes in one will. So there's, there's a concurring pattern between all of these Christological systems as compared to orthodoxy. Because we believe in two wills. So as I said, prosopic union, there's two prosopa united in one prosopa. You can, if you don't know what prosopa means, you can say it's, they are masked, they are external factors, they are external realities. And so the two external realities come together and form one external reality. So you see one person, right? When you, when you look at Christ, you see one person. When you see, you don't see the divine nature, the human nature, you just see the person, you just see the external reality. The external reality is one. And so for Nestorius, is a prosopic union. The two prosopa become one prosopon. So as Father McCulkin points out, by the way, he, he questions. He says, at this point, we can't really see how he does not fall under. He doesn't say this, but at this point, he seems to be, previously, what did we say? Two cannot become one. But then he says two become one. And strangely enough, he speaks of the two prosopa maintaining their identity, but then he speaks of one prosopon. And so this is, this is the case because for him, the one prosopon, the oneness, is only a conceptual oneness. It's not a, a real oneness of Nestorius. And 
Uh, I think an important question that we will have to ask in the story is, and I don't think we have a really sufficient answer for from him at this stage, is that what what do you mean by person? What is a person? Right? Is it the external factor? Is that what what a person is? Is it the acting subject? Does that mean person? Right? So for that, for Nestorius, we don't really know the answer. And I don't think he can give us the answer because whatever answer he gives is going to be nonsensical. There's a concrete distinction of the natures after the union. This is going to be very crucial because if you've watched several of my videos, a concrete distinction of the natures will imply that the natures are subjects. And if the natures are subjects, then there are two subjects, right? There are two, if there are two subjects because of a concrete distinction. If there are two subjects, then you have two persons, human person, divine person. But there is a concrete distinction of the natures. The divine things are only attributed to the divinity and vice versa. So there's no communicatio idiomatum. Uh, there's no exchange of properties in the one person, right? The properties of divinity are not shared by the humanity. It's only the divinity's properties. Likewise for the humanity. The divinity does not share in the properties of the humanity. Therefore, the Virgin Mary cannot be said to be Theotokos because it only gave birth to the human nature, then gave birth to the divine nature, and there's no exchange of properties. So she can only be said to be the mother of the man. And thus God did not also suffer on the cross. Right? So there's a rejection of Theopascism here. And also grace for uh, Nestorius is utterly distinct from nature. What does that mean? Actually, we'll get to that in the next slide as well. But before we get to that, I want to talk about the theologies of Theodore of Mopsus and Theodore of Tarsus because oftentimes the talk is about Nestorius himself, but not about the birth givers of Nestorianism. You see, Theodore of Mopsus and Theodore of Tarsus and probably many other people were proto-Nestorians. Uh, they believed they, they were even bigger Nestorians than Nestorius himself. So let's start with Theodore of Tarsus, who he is. He, is, he died in 390. He's a canonized saint in the Church of the East and the Eastern Catholic Churches. The Syro Malabar and Chaldean Catholics. Theodore says that for while the Lord was in the bowels of the Virgin and of her essence, he had not the honor of sonship. But when he was fashioned and became a temple for God the Word, in that he received the only begotten, he took the honor of the name and was participant with him in the honor. This is, St. Kirill quotes Diodor in his Against Diodor. This is something that Diodor says. I don't even think I need to make a commentary. This is, a, this is very obviously preaching two-person Christology, right? That, they, that there is a human Christ, that there is a human Jesus. He did not receive the word of God until after his birth. So this is basically adoptionism. It's pretty much adoptionism, right? The man Jesus was adopted by God and then he was united in conjunction with God. Theodor of Mopsuestia uh, lived from 350 to 428. He was the Archbishop of Mopsuestia. He is also a saint in the Church of the East uh, and the Eastern Catholic Churches. For him, Mary is anthropotokos, meaning that he, she is the mother of the man. And both of them, both Theodore and Diodor, supported universalism in the Book of the Bee. In the Book of the Bee, at that date, Solomon, Bishop of Basra, clearly proclaimed the salvation of all men. In confirmation of that doctrine, he quotes the opinions of Theodore of Mopsuestia and Theodore of Tarsus, both eminent Christian fathers of an early age. He also asserts that other Nestorian writers taught the same sentiment. Many other eminent defenders of this faith might be mentioned down to the days of the Reformation. So, there is a universalism in, the, in this. Now, let's get back a couple slides. Let's get back a couple minutes. What did I mention? If you believe in monotheletism, logically speaking, your doctrine is universalism. And many of these historians saw that because there's a unity of the human person and the divine person there's a unity in terms of wills. And so if all nature is going to be restored, then does that, that, does that not mean that we're all going to be restored? That we're all going to be saved? That we're all going to be united by will? And that we're going to be in conjunction with God by His divine will? Of course. And it's precisely what Nestorianism reduces it, itself to. 
So here, this is a page from uh, Father John Muckuckin's book on St. Kirill of Alexandria. Uh, he speaks of a union by uh, God's good favor and grace. And he and this is, I believe, Theodore of Malpsuestia, right? So he's talking about Theodore of Malpsuestia. He has three alternatives. Union by nature. This is the, this is the option that St. Kirill chose. Union by mutual engagement, right? By energy. And union by God's, God's grace. He had determined that the third one was the only feasible option, a view which, with which the story is concurred, as we have seen. The natural union implied such mechanical necessity for the Antiochians and seemed to threaten the very survival of at least one of the natures as an object of reality. So if you believed in a natural union of the two essence, two substances, then it had to be necessary, right? So it removes the free will aspect. How did they get that critique? I don't really know. It doesn't make any sense, but that's their critique. And so... Nestorius takes that view and further on in this book it's also talking about uh, a, a huge distinction between nature and grace right he regards the divine nature as the source of all grace and does does not believe that the concepts nature and grace can be separated in a meaningful sense this is actually let me read from the start uh, Bailey's elegant book God was in Christ is much more concerned with the implications it is often erroneously taught that Kirill's preferred stress on a natural basis for the Christological union divorces him from this insight. In fact, Kirill regards human nature as the primary gift of God's grace and its restoration in Christ as the primary end of the incarnation. He regards the divine nature as the source of all grace, yes, so this is in Kirill, and thus does not believe that the concepts nature and grace can be separated in any meaningful sense. Nestorius' attitude in the distinction he made was one that Augustine shared independently because of his particular theology of grace as utterly distinct from nature. Following in this Western Augustinian tradition, Bailey rightly sees a strong connection between Nestorius and many of the Western presuppositions. Another difference that we have with Second Europe. And this is a, this is a very good page because... Uh, you can read it for yourself, but this is about Nestorius trying to convince Theodotus of Ankara. So Theodotus initially supported Nestorius. He was sympathetic to him and he listened to Nestorius, but Nestorius was too too scholastic. He was too, he was too much of a Thomas Aquinas for him. And so Theodotus just tried to say, Nestorius, just tell me simply, right? I mean, isn't, isn't the Virgin Mary... Can't you just say that this is God that's doing these things? I mean, Christ is God. You will agree with me here. So why does this title not apply to his human acts? And so Nestorius eventually got really angry. On 18th of June, Nestorius lost patience with Theodotus. On why the title of God ought to be reserved for the acts proper to the Logos, why the title of Jesus ought to be reserved to the acts proper to the human being, right, the names that we talked about in the previous slides, and why the titles Christ, Lord, or Son ought to be reserved to signify the sphere of concerted action. To what appears to have been Theodotus' appeal for a simpler answer as to what was wrong with the straightforward confession of Jesus as God, Nestorius replied impatiently, We must not call the one who became man for us God. Very questionable statement. What does that mean, Nestorius? He decided to press his point home that language about the incarnate Lord had to observe strict rules if it was to avoid foolish incongruities. Incongruities. I don't know how to spell it. And compounded his difficulties by telling that the shocked, by telling the shocked Theodotus, I refuse to acknowledge as God, an infant of two or three months old. So what Nestorius is trying to do here is kind of like what Muslims are trying to do. How can you call a baby a God? That doesn't make any sense. And this was used against him in the Council of Ephesus as proof that he believed in two sons Christology. Now let's get to St. Kirill of Alexandria. St. Kirill of Alexandria was born in Egypt. Uh, his feast day is uh, 18th of January, 9th, 9th of June. In the Western Rite, I believe his feast day is in February 9th. He's the successor of Theophilus of Alexandria, who is his uncle. Oh, I, I misspelled Alexandria. Never mind. Was, he was a bishop of Alexandria for 32 years he was a bishop for a long time so he had a lot of experience as a bishop he was a biblical exegete he may, he may, he was mainly concerned with commentaries of the bible until the Nestorian crisis that's when he shifted his focus from from the bible to 
attacking Nestorius's Christology. Now, this is, I think this is important to note because both Nestorius and St. Kirill come from uh, very heavily scriptural backgrounds, right? And this is very significant because both their theologi theologies in name are scriptural, right? It's heavily based on scripture, but it showcases that the different presuppositions can alter your views of scripture. And so if you look, if you compare the scriptural views of Nestorius and St. Kirill, in, in many key verses, they have differing views. So St. Kirill was instrumental in Ephesus 431. His theology was the basis of Chalcedon in 451 and Constantinople II in 553. So for three councils, uh, St. Kirill's Christology has been very instrumental in orthodoxy. So he, St. Kirill is a very big deal. That's the lesson that we have to learn. Let's look at St. Kirill's responses to Nestorius. For him, that there is a real natural union of two natures in Christ's hypostasis, right? The term unites according to hypostasis is used 17 times in contra Nestorium, against Nestorius alone. This is from Hans von Lund's book on Kirill of Alexandria's DFS Christology, page 521. The natures of Christ are not acting subjects. The two what's do not imply two who's, which is what Nestorius does. So for Saint, so he's kind of repeating St. Gregory the Theologian who says Christ is one thing and another, not one subject and another. So allo kai allo, uk allos kai allos in Greek. The duality, duality and unity, general concepts, they're not dialectically opposed. You can have both of them simultaneously. And this is very crucial because for us, right, the Trinity is one and multiple. The Trinity is one in nature. It's one in will, energy, but it's three in persons. Whereas in Christ, suddenly, well, you can say many in person, whereas in the, in the case of Christ, Christ is one in person, but many in natures, wills, energies. Both the divine and human things are attributed to Christ, for both natures are Christ's. So both of the natures of Christ are predicated on Him. So there is an exchange of properties, which means that if Christ eats, we can say that God ate. If Christ was born of the Virgin Mary, we can say that the Virgin Mary is the Theotokos. Right? So this is the, the so the title of Theotokos signifies this exchange of properties. That God really became man, truly became man, and things that are proper to man can also be attributed to him. And so God can be said to be suffering. On the cross. Many Muslims, uh, Muslim apologists, miss this. They don't understand this concept. I hope they try to understand it. I think it's very crucial. Now, what I'm going to be looking at are is the 12 anatomies of St. Kirill against Nestorius. This is in the third letter of St. Kirill's against Nestorius. And this these 12 anatomies are canonized at Ephesus 1. Right? It's very crucial. It's St. Kirill's main attack against Nestorius, and the main purpose is to force Nestorius to admit a single subject Christology. And I want to say before we start, before I start reading the 12, I, I won't read the whole of the 12 anatomas, but I'm kind of going to summarize each of the anatomas. But I want to say this, the general idea, here's a bit of a spoiler alert, the general idea is that St. Kirill says the divine and human things are attributed to the person of Christ. Whereas Nestorius says, no, they're attributed to the natures. Those, th those are the general arguments that you will be seeing throughout the 12 anatomas. Because I also include Nestorius' responses to the anatomas. And this is crucial because a lot of people misunderstand the debate because of that. They think they see St. Kirill emphasizing on the person on how the things, the, the human and divine things are attributed to the person, and they say, oh, St. Kirill then is he's monoenergist, or he's like the monophysites, right? The monophysites are then right, because we don't attribute the things to the natures, we attribute to the to Christ. Whereas, it seems like Nestorius, he's attributed things to the different natures. And this is the kind of uh, fallacious argument that a lot of people use. Well, uh, Pope Leo seems to be using the same arguments, seems to be closer to Nestorius, is what a lot of these people say. This is a misunderstanding of St. Kirill's theology, because St. Kirill, Kirill himself says that in regards to our speech, at times we do introduce two persons. Now, 
what does he say? He doesn't say that we believe in two persons. But he says, grammatically speaking, we introduce two subjects. It's, it's as if we have two subjects. So the problem with Nestorius is not that he, attributed, he attributes things to nature. Right? It's not that he attributes divine things to the divine nature. That's actually a correct thing. The main issue is that he doesn't go beyond that. He doesn't take the next step. He rejects the next step. He thinks the next step is heretical. That's the main problem with Nestorius. And so Pope St. Leo does not make this mistake. He does not make this crucial mistake. And so this is where they differ with Nestorius. And this is the argument that a lot of Monophysites historically use. Severus of Antioch used this argument numerous times where he compares Diophysite statements in compare and they contrast with what Nestorius says. And oh, you guys agree here and we disagree here. And St. Kirill disagrees here. Therefore, St. Kirill agrees with us. No, it's not as simple as that. So in short, in orthodoxy, we will say things are divine things are attributed to the divine nature, but ultimately they're also attributed to the person because it's the person that has those natures, right? They're not just abstract natures that we just attribute them to. They are personal. They're personalized in the person of Christ, in the one single person of Christ. So let's get to the anathemas. I will be summarizing them. You can read uh, top is St. Kirill's and bottom is Nestorius' response. So anathema one is Nestorius rejecting the title Mother of God. Because for him, that title implies that the divine nature was given birth, as we mentioned before. Key here, key thing here is the lack of communicatio idiomatum by Nestorius. And this is something that is going to be repeated in the Anatomas because his rejection of exchange of properties is going to lead him to various different problems. Second Anatoma, Nestorius controverts that this is this is from God History Dialectic Volume 4, page uh, 832. This is Joseph Farrell's commentary on Anatoma 2. Nestorius controverts the idea that perichoresis, divine indwelling, right, indwelling, which results from the union, means that the divine nature in Christ communicates its energy of ubiquity to the human nature, and that the human nature therefore becomes ubiquitous. This is the Lutheran explanation for the real presence of the body and blood in the Eucharist. Notably, Kirill denies that there is such an, an, such, any such understanding of the perichoresis or, the, or of the hypostatic union itself. Nevertheless, the bread and wine are truly body and blood, and these in turn are truly life-giving, because the hypostasis underlying them is the word and one and the same. So it's emphasizing the hypostatic reality of Christ's human nature in the second anatoma, and Nestorius rejects that. <clears throat> anatoma 3, St. Kirill here believes in a real unity of natures in Christ's hypostasis. For Nestorius, a real unity implies mixture, lack of a distinction between uh, nature and person. Therefore, the natures, instead, instead of being mixed, they're separated, but, they, but their unity is in conjunction. They work in conjunction. So their, their will is one. They do the same thing. They work in conjunction. They're two partners working together. That's the best. That's the better analogy that we can use. So the unity of Christ, according to Nestorius, is based on will. The unity of Christ, according to Saint Kirill, is based on person. Right? It's personal. Anatoma four. For Nestorius, if Christ eats, we cannot in any way say God ate, because eating is not proper to the divine nature. Even if Nestorius will admit that Christ is God, for eating. Uh, so this problem has the same issue with the first anatoma. Anatoma 5, and the source explicitly admits the doctrine of two sons here, if you read his response. He rejects one son Christology. He says, if anyone ventured to say that even after the assumption of human nature, there is only one son of God, namely he who is so in nature, let him be anatoma. This is why Nestorianism leads to a quaternity, because now there are two sons of God. And there's a human son of God, and now he is in, in, in the Trinity, it, and the Trinity becomes a quaternity. It's the reason why that critique even exists in the first place. Number six uh, is kind of similar to the anatomas that we've seen. Nestorius is treating the humanity of Christ as a subject. So again, a contrast, saying Kirill attributes the sayings to the, ultimately to the person, the stories does not take that step. No, 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 no. Before you do that, you have to attribute to the to the to the natures. Another clear example of the source Christology leading to his two sons, the humanity of Christ is said to be only begotten because of its connection with the divine nature, right? 
So it's again treating the human nature as a separate subject. As we have seen, St. Kirill says Christ is only given one worship. So this is an argument I've used against the Sacred Heart. And if you read the controversy between St. Kirill and the, and the Orientals, this will be very clear that what I'm saying is right in regards to the Sacred Heart is that if you have two worships, right? What, what are you worshipping? Well, you're worshipping the divine nature and the human nature separately, as if they're two distinct subjects. And for St. Kirill, that's a problem. So the Nestorius distinguishes worships between the natures. St. Kirill, this is, point, this is pointing out uh, the exchange of properties and how the two natures are united in the person of Christ. Nestorius' response, as usual, is, no, that you can't have that. St. Kirill is arguing for how the flesh of God gives life to justify the Eucharist. Nestorius responds with that, that the body is only deified because of the divine nature in conjunction, because it's only operating together. Uh, we cannot say that it is de deified by nature. Now, St. Kirill is say not saying that human nature is divine by nature, but it is deified by the divine energies, that it is, uh, and it's hypostatic unites the divine nature, and the divine energies deify the human nature. And this shall be a problem for Nestorius, because if the flesh is life-giving only because it is in conjunction with the divine nature, then what we eat in the Eucharist is only a mere human body. It's not a hypostatically united life-giving flesh. Therefore, Nestorian Christology, logically speaking, must reject the Eucharist as the real presence. How can it be the real presence of God if the natures only work in conjunction? Right, rather than being hypostatically united. And the stories will then say, oh, are you saying then that you're eating the human essence? Absolutely not. We're not doing that. But the human nature of Christ is hypostatically united in the person of Christ. So it is God's human body. It's God's flesh. It's God's blood. And that's why it's deifying. It's life-giving. It's deified by God's divine energies that interpenetrate, interpenetrate His human nature. And at 11, Nestorius is once more dividing the sayings according to the natures and St. Kirill attributes human and divine sayings to Christ. Once more, Nestorius categorically rejects that. We've seen this over and over again. It's another case of this. Nestorius says that God cannot suffer. Saying that God suffers is saying divine nature suffers. This, hence, lack of communicatio idiomatum. Same logic with denying the title of the Theotokos. Now, let's get to Eutychianism and the Calculian aftermath. We're done with Nestorius and how he got refuted and how his Christology differs from Kyrillian Christology and Orthodox Christology. So now let's get to what happens after Ephesus 1. And I will put the timeline in the summary section. So what is Eutychianism? It's also referred to as Synusiasism. The belief is that the natures, the substances of Christ were mixed into being one. So the, so when Nestorius says, Kirill, your theology leads to this, if there's two realities that become one, there must be a mixture, the Eutychians basically go down that route. So they diverge from St. Kirill's point. And why does this happen? Because they fail to distinguish nature and person properly. Structurally, it's the same thing as, it has the same structure as Nestorianism, but it takes the opposite approach. Eutychians, in the Home Synod of Constantinople 448, rejected the human consubstantiality of Christ. And this is why he was condemned. Now, I want to talk about this, this controversial term because this is associated with St. Kirill of Alexandria. And I will recommend to read Hans von Lund's book, Kirill of Alexandria's Deophysic Christology, because it's very enlightening how it explains that Kirill, Kirill's Christology was not based completely on this Miaphysis statement. As a matter of fact, Miaphysis, the one nature of God, the Word, and flesh, is only used three times before 433. It's very interesting. The first time is used in against Nestorius, book two, and he straight up uses that term, but then he afterwards contrasts it with body and soul union, how a human person becomes one out of two. And so it's not... So it's basically saying out of two realities, Christ becomes one. So he's not really saying anything different from that. Second time he uses in the letter to the sisters. This is to the royalty. 
royal sisters. And he used a quotation from supposedly from St. Athanasius' epistle to Jovian. And the main purpose of it was not the term Miaphysis, but because it contains the title Theotokos is the, is the reason why he uses that quotation. So we, can't, we don't even have to quote that. And then, so this is the, this is, so there's two times he uses that term before 431. Between 431 and 433, he uses the term once against Orientals, and he once more quotes St. Athanasius, supposedly, Epistle to Jovian. And the main purpose this time is that the quote speaks of one worship, not two. So really, before 433, St. Kirill only uses, deliberately uses one Miaphysite statement. One, me, one he, he used Mia Physis only once before 433. This is very significant. We have to think about this. Why is this the case? And it's going to be very crucial for us in order to understand the theology of St. Kirill of Alexandria. This term was used extensively by Alexandrians because of the recent documents that start to become attributed to saints, such as Gregory Thaumaturgus, Athanasius, Pope Julius. And here is the kicker. Of the Mia Physis phrase. And if you've been watching my videos, I've, I've repeatedly said this line numerous times, but the documents where the saints talk about one nature of Christ, one nature of God, the Word, in the flesh, all of those, all of those documents attributed to those saints are forgeries. And Leitzman's book on Apollonius of Laodicea is very good on that. So Leonce of Jerusalem in Against the Monastics, page 123, he talks about John, John of Scutopolis, and he points out he one of the examples, right? He John of Bishop Bishop, uh, Bishop Polis, John of Scutopolis found the passage in a text of uh, of Pope Julius, right? So a letter attributed to Pope Julius, he finds it, and he looks at it. He looks at it for a couple pages. He says, what follows a few pages later after the Mia Fiza statement, in the same volume, it becomes clear that it's a work from Apollonius. And his, his argument is that it says Lord's body was not animated by a soul. And Pope St. Julius will never say such a thing because we assume that he's Orthodox. We assume that he's not Apollinarian. So unless you want to throw Pope St. Julius under the bus and say he's Apollinarian, we know for sure that that is cannot be attributed to Pope St. Julius. And this is the case with all of the Apollinarian forgeries. So from 6th century to 21st century, scholarship agrees that all of these documents are Apollinarian forgeries. So the first time, the first father to legitimately use one nature terminology is St. Kirill of Alexandria. Now I want to remind you people that one nature can be orthodox if you have a good understanding of it. Apollinarius did not have an understanding, but St. Kirill had. Because for him, one nature meant one reality, one um, hypostasis, right? Nature will mean hypostasis. It could mean component, right? So for example, component reality, you can say the same thing. So out of two realities, it becomes one. But the sense of the word reality or nature that is used for one nature of Christ is different when we're talking about the two natures. That is component. So these are two different things. It's kind of like with... Right, body is a nature, soul is a nature, but the word nature, when we're talking about body and soul, is different from when we're talking about human nature itself. Right? They, they are different things. So that's what I'm basically getting at here. So it can be orthodox, of course, because we are terminologically flexible, but doctrinally rigid. That's what Christian theology and its history basically is. But why am I focusing this? Because this caused, these, these quotations caused so many problems. So many problems in the subsequent uh, controversies. And one of the arguments that Monophysites used was, well, Miaphysis has patristic basis. And they used the Apollinarian forgeries to prove their point. It has patristic basis. Because it has patristic basis, uh, we know for certain, uh, and you, yours, your, your belief does not have patristic basis. So we know for certain that you're wrong, we're right. When it's actually the opposite. <laughs> because their theology based on um, forgeries that they, they themselves didn't know. I'm sure that Severus of Antioch, 
maybe he didn't know the nature of the forgery so maybe he realized and said oh i'm screwed <laughs> we'll get to that in the next part so 20th century study on napoleon forgeries was done by hans Lietzmann. uh many scholars quote from that 6th century 21st century scholarship agrees with it and i think very good proof for what I'm saying. So some people might say, I don't believe you. You might have scholars on your side. You might have some people on your side say this. And maybe, yes, some of the quotations might be questionable. But I still don't believe. I, I'm not convinced. Well, reminder, where is Apollinarius from? Syria. Why does this matter? Well, if Apollinarius used one nature la language, then it only makes sense that the Syrians will know about it, right? The Syrians of St. Kirill's time will know about it. Well, of course, right? It only makes sense. When St. Kirill said one nature, this is very interesting because when he said one nature, he got accused of Apollinarianism. And that confused not only St. Kirill, but everyone else. I mean, how is that Apollinarian? Could it be Apollinarian? Because the term he used is a term that they themselves are aware of that they were aware of and that they were aware that a heretic used it just a couple of years ago food for thought and i think this is a very very convincing proof that mia physis was by apollinarius originally and that's that it comes from him that's a heretical not a heretical form but it's a that it's a formula with a heretical basis and here we see timothy of beirut in his ecclesiastical history uh, he says, uh, Leon's Jerusalem says, A certain Timothy, a disciple of Apollinarius in his church history, uh, his, and his companion Polemon says, Those who say that the, Christ, the same Christ is both God and man aren't ashamed of confessing one incarnate nature of God the Word as being some sort of compound Christ. That is to say, if the same Christ is complete God and complete man, then he is two natures, just what the Cappadocian innovation introduces as to the opinions of Diodor and Athanasius and the vanity of the Italians. So, who believes in two natures? According to Timothy of Beirut, Cappadocians, Protonistorians, Athanasius, Italians. <laughs> Again, remember this for the next part. I'm going to be reusing re these terms. Uh, quotes in the next video most probably uh, they pretend that they really belong to our party and that they hold the opinions of our holy father apollinarius Pooh! but they proclaim just what the gregories proclaim gregories it's talking about gregory of nyssa and gregory the theologian well the gregories proclaim the duality of nature so apollinarians themselves say that they believe in two natures but then that this is this was important for our preparation. What happened at the Council of Chalcedon? What went down there? What went down? Very important. Before we talk about Chalcedon, we first need to talk about the Second Council of Ephesus. In Constantinople, in the Home Synod of 448 in Constantinople, Eutychus was condemned for rejection, rejecting Christ's consubstantiality, consubstantiality with us. I'm sorry, I'm unable to read today. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dioscorus saw that there is an affirmation of two nature in Christology in Constantinople 448. And so with this reason, he restored Eutychus back into communion before Ephesus 2. I believe next slide. Yes. Oh, no. Not here. But he restored Eutychus back into communion before Ephesus 2 even happened in the first place. So he didn't take the condemnation seriously. He basically protected Eutychus. And I also want to note, I talked about this in a debate review of... Uh, my debate review with the Orientals. And I pointed out that the one nature sentiment started to grow because of these forgeries. And so the Alexandrian position became the me of his position over time because of those document documents. Because people saw, people saw the debate. People saw the debate that was happening. And they saw the story is speaking of two natures. And then they looked at these documents and they saw of the fathers speaking of one nature. And then they compared them and so well, the fathers say one nature and the story says two nature and the story is a heretic. So that means one nature is the true Christology. So this was the logical process for many of the people 
who were One Nature supporters. He condemned, uh, this is Dioscorus in Ephesus 2, condemned St. Flavian, Dalmas of Antioch, Ebas of Edessa, Theodor Tosaris, Eusebius of Dorylaeum. None of these people, this is very crucial, none, is not a single one of these people was able to defend themselves. Their condemnation was in absentia. They were unable to defend themselves. And their condemnations are uncanonical. So Eusebius was at the council and he literally wants to defend himself and he was not allowed to. And there's an innovation that happened in Ephesus too and that there was a monk called Barsaumas who was a full participant in this council. Now if you don't know, monks cannot be full participants in a council. But he was. He was basically considered like a bishop. Like if a bishop... What a bishop was in a council, Barsomas was that. He was a full member in a council. This, this was an innovation. This was a new thing that happened. All of this stuff that I mentioned, by the way, Father Richard Price talks about this in his Acts of the, the Council of Chalcedon. So you can read it yourself. And he basically mentions these things. Like here, Barsomas was leading a Syrian Archimandrite who took part as a full member of Ephesus too, where he incited the monks against Flavian of Constantinople and his sympathizers. Having a monk as a full member of an ecumenical council was an innovation. For his dramatic intervention at the Council of Chalcedon, after refusing to accept the decrees of the council, he returned to Syria, where he campaigned against them until his death in 458. And he's a saint in their church. So the point of the Chalcedonian council, as Diogenes of Chysicus said in Chalcedon, I believe session 4, he says, the council, Diogenes doesn't say Diogenes the most devout bishop of Chysicus, but... Diogenes of Chysicus says the council took place because of Eutyches, surely not for any other reason. And this really points out that this is a reversal of Ephesus too. And so it also ended up logically being a council where a dispute needed to be settled on the issue of natures of Christ and to unequivocally and obviously explicitly condemn Eutychianism once and for all. Now, there are misconceptions at the Council of Chalcedon. At the same time, I've talked about this issue at, at length. So if you're interested in my defense of the Council of Chalcedon against the, against the anti-Chalcedonian arguments, I will recommend you check out my defense of Cal uh, Council of Chalcedon, also known as part two of my Oriental Orthodox Refuted video series. Uh, it will probably appear in top right, as I'm talking right now. And if you're willing to watch the debate that I had with the Oriental Orthodox, which we dealt with the issue of the Council of Chalcedon. I also deal with that in the debate and also in the debate review that I've done. So I have multiple different videos where I defend the Council of Chalcedon and I make the similar arguments. I'm sounding like a broken record for the people that have watched my videos. But here are the misconceptions of the Council of Chalcedon. Uh, a lot of people think that it's a victory for the Antiochian uh, dualist theology. Uh, this understanding that it's a betrayal of St. Kyrill's essential points because they look at from two natures was rejected in the first draft of the definition. Now, this is easily explainable. Uh, from two natures was used by Dioscorus, who was anatomized at the council. And it was also used by Eutyches, who Dioscorus protected. And so many of the people saw at Chalcedon, they said, well... You know, this is something that heretics use. So if you just say from two natures and end it there, we haven't really said anything different. And the purpose of the council is to basically introduce something that rejects Eutychianism in, in its definition. So the two, are, two natures, which is associated with Nestorius, was used in Chalcedon rather than one nature, which is associate with, associated with St. Kirill of Alexandria. Which, ironically, I will say two natures should also be associated with St. Kirill of Alexandria. Uh, letter 53 is the case with that. But also, Glafir on the Pentateuch, where he quite literally says Christ is in two natures. So there are statements from St. Kirill of Alexandria where he explicitly says Christ is two natures. The Council of Chalcedon, accepting Ibas and Theodoret, proves that uh, it had Nestorian sympathies. Whereas, again, the intention is to reverse Ephesus too. And so Ibas and Theodor were both condemned in absentia, uncanonically. If they were condemned canonically, then this will be a different story. But they were condemned uncanonically. And so that has to, had to be reversed. 
Thus, the later developments, referred to as Neo-Chalcedonianism, is an attempt at rehabilitating Chalcedon with St. Kirill. This implies, in this, in this point of view, that, that the Fifth Council is in inherent contradiction with the Fourth Council. This is wrong. This is a wrong, imp this is a wrong misconception about the Council of Chalcedon. The Chalcedonian Council is very Kirillian by itself already, actually, when you actually look into it. And I've already done several videos where I look into this. So I copied this slide from my debate review. Uh, in its definition, the Chalcedonian Council distinguishes the natures in thought. So the distinction is not concrete. If it's not concrete, then there cannot be two subjects. Thus, Chalcedon actually does reject prosopic union, unlike what the Monophysites claim. There's a Theopat there's a Theopascat formula in the Tome of Leo. Uh, the things that uh, that Saint Leo says in his tome is said by various different fathers as well. So there's a patristic support for his uh, doctrines. It accepts the first council of Ephesus, which also means that Chalcedon accepts the twelve chapters. So when we look at the Chalcedonian Council, we look at it from the point of view of Kyrillian theology and the theology of the first Ephesian Council. And that's the point of view that, it, that we look at from, not from a neutral, this neutral scholarly, this, this folk scholarly neutral point of view, but rather from the point of view of the first Ephesian Council as a continuation of that council. Kyrillic Chalcedonian interpretation being the only dogmatic interpretation taxed the fifth ecumenical council, very crucial. The acceptance of Ibas and Theodor is based on reversing Ephesus 2. Uh, the Chalcedonian definition was written by Kyrillians. None, none of those who wrote the definition that is supposedly Nestorian was written by a Nestorian or a supporter of Nestorius or a supporter of uh, Theodoret or Ibas. None of the definition writers, were, all of them, were explicit supporters of St. Kirill of Alexandria. The Tome of Leo is interpreted in light of Kyrillian theology. Remember the popular statement, uh, Peter spoke through Leo, but the reason why he spoke through Leo is because Leo said the same things Kyrill said. And that's why there's a five-day commission. There's a commission that spent five days cross-referencing the Tome in light of St. Kyrill's writings. And Into Natures has patristic backing. And if you want to, if you want to look at that, I have a video Orange Orthodox Refuted Part 3, Deophysitism in the Church Fathers, whereas one nature only has outdated heretical backing. So, in summary, this will be the end of the video. We're approaching the end of this video. In summary, Apollinaris' chief error was reducing personhood to a category. Nestorianism is a lot more complex than what the straw man of it is, but nevertheless, logically, it leads to the straw man that uh, it is caricatured as, so it's not f fully inaccurate. It is actually very accurate, and the Apollinarian forgeries of the of the of the fathers are supposedly that supposedly speak of one nature. So the Apollinarian forgeries that were attributed to the fathers and the stories speaking of two natures cause a lot of confusion in the fifth and sixth centuries. And so here is a timeline of what happened from 428, from the time Nestorius became patriarch, to 451, the Council of Chalcedon. <clears throat> Nestorius becomes patriarch of Constantinople. He says that uh, Mary is not Theotokos, and St. Kirill decides to respond to this, and he, starts to, and he spends 428, the year of 428, studying the fathers. Uh, between 429 and 431, there's a battle between St. Kirill and Nestorius, and meanwhile, in the West, St. Leo, Pope St. Leo, at the time, who was an archdeacon, uh, he goes to Rome, he tells people about Nestorius, he says, Nestorius is a heretic, we need to get rid of him. And thanks to St. Leo's efforts, Nestorius is condemned by Rome in 430. By the way, if uh, Rome condemned Nestorius, then why did we need uh, an ecumenical council condemning him? Oh, I don't know. But food for thought for Roman Catholics. Then we have Council of Ephesus. Uh, we have John of Antioch arriving late. He starts an historian council and anathematizing St. Gil. So we have now two councils of Ephesus. There's a battle between which one is the real one. After 433, there's a reunion between Alexandria and Antioch that started at 431. Right? So it healed the schism. 
and acceptance of the union of natures is argued from both sides as orthodox. So what? So both Saint Kirill and John of Antioch are considered as right when they're speaking of the natures of Christ, and Mia Physis becomes Mia Hypostasis, and then Saint Kirill starts writing against after 433 against the originates of Nestorianism, and we start seeing Mia Physis appear in Saint Kirill's vocabulary because, as I mentioned before. He kind of had to because it became a very popular term over time in Alexandria. And so he basically rolled with it. But especially he was a, he was when he, even when he was aware of the one nature uh, quotations that he thought were from the fathers. He seldom he barely used it. He only used it once. Until many of his uh, fellow partisans started to question him because of his reunion with the Antiochians. Then, uh, St. Proclus becomes uh, a diplomatic person. Not diplomatic. He becomes a diplomat for St. Kirill. That's the word I was trying to look for. He becomes St. Kirill's diplomat. He starts, he starts to spread his Christology to Byzantine Constantinople and Anatolia. St. Kirill dies in 444. Theodore Cyrus composes the Arianistus. This is an example of St. Proctus' efforts because we see Theodore Cyrus, who debated, who attacked St. Kirill numerous times. Now he's using his concept and his argumentation in his book of Arianis, his book called Arianistus. Eutyches is, a condemned her is condemned as a heretic in 448. But then we have a robber council in 449 that deposes St. Flavian, reinstates Eutychius. Uh, then we have, and there's a lot of school degree in 449. And then two years later, we have the Council of Chalcedon. And this will be the end. And so what happens after Chalcedon? What more adventures will we see? I'm excited. And so shall you be, because the next part most likely is going to be the best part out of all of the videos that I made in History of Christian Theology. And I would like to thank you all for watching this video and listening to me rant for more than an hour. I'll see you guys in the next video. But before I say goodbye, be sure to click like and share this video around. Help more people learn about the wondrous history of Christian theology. And if you like this content and if you want to see more, don't hesitate to subscribe to my channel. And if you want to monetarily support me, you can do that on Patreon. But if you have monetary issues, then please don't donate to me. I don't want your money. But if you want to donate to me and you don't have money issues, then if you want to, then feel free to do so. I would like to again thank you all for watching this. I'll see you guys in the next video. God be with you all.